talk about a project um, that I did with some colleagues of mine, uh, which is this little pro this which emerges this little book here called After Oil. And I want to talk about this in part because I brought a bunch of copies, and if you're interested in it, you can grab one at the back of the room there. It's where the um, it's on that side table. Um, we brought together 30 uh, scholars from across the disciplines this summer, and we told them, come spend a week with us in Edmonton um, in August, and uh, you don't have to present a paper, just come up there and we'll have a good time. And what we didn't explain to them, and everybody accepted because why not, right? Um, what, we didn't, what they didn't know is that we would ask them to work really, really hard while they were there, and what we wanted them to do is write a book. So the 30 of us over three days wrote this short little book, um, which we then put together and published ourselves. And it will also be available from the new Culture and Energy series that West Virginia University Press is putting out. But um, we wanted to try to do it ourselves to see what it, what, whether we could experiment simultaneously with writing, with academic publishing, with new ways of, of putting out knowledge, and I guess with the with ways of collaboration that I think we do all too infrequently in humanity. So this is something that none of us have, oh sorry, this is something that is kind of unauthored in a way, um, but which I think all of those who, who collaborated in doing this found to be a process that was uh, as enriching a, uh, an event as anything they've ever done in their careers. And it's something that's a little bit different than sharing um, inf information via paper. So it's something that I plan to do in the future as well. Um, and now, having said that, there's this new way of doing work, which is collaborative. I guess I'll go ahead and give a paper all on my own. Um, but I'll make it short. And if, and if the copies run out and you'd like one, just let me know. I can uh, give you your address and I'll send you one. OK. So, um, Stacy and I, and I hope I can speak for her, we've been a little bit worried about the fact that our papers might not fit into the discussion that's been taking place for the past two days. We're not speaking about Latin America specifically. However, I think that a, a lot of the discussion has been about the necessity of new ways of knowing when it comes to thinking about the environment and environmental futures. And that I, I hope that this paper will participate in that discussion and what it, how it will do so is that it will insist on the need to think about energy, uh, to make energy part of our understanding of society, politics, um, literature, new media, I guess of everything that's going to make that strong claim. I think it also speaks, or I hope it also speaks directly to the role of the humanities in environmental discussions. And uh, here I'm going to talk about the, environment, the, energy, the role of the humanities in making sense of energy systems. The title is Living After Oil. The subtitle is On the Energy Humanities. And that's what I'm going to try to make a case for. So, oops. <clears throat> oil transformed life in the 20th century. In the 21st century, it may well deform what's left of it. Slowly, all too slowly, we are beginning to realize the degree to which oil has made us who and what we moderns are, shaping our quotidian existence close at hand while narrating us into networks of power and commerce far, far away. At the heart of this growing, of this newfound awareness of oil's importance to our sensibilities and expectations of perpetual growth, ceaseless mobility, and expanded social possibilities is our recognition that over the course of this century, we will need to extract ourselves from our dependence on oil in order to transition to new energy sources. The transition we will need to make is not from fossil fuels to renewables, or at least not only that. Fossil fuels constitute a social form, a material arrangement of social relations and a system of symbolic and imaginary investments. In June 2015, the G7 nations pronounced that the era of fossil fuels would end by 2100. With this declaration, we have embarked upon a calculated social transformation without historical precedent, especially given the scope uh, and scale um, involved. By scope, I mean that the Earth's population may reach 10 billion by the end of the century, 
and the scale is, of course, that this transformation will have to affect every uh, the, the infrastructure of almost everything on the planet. In its abundance, oil transformed every dimension of life over the course of the 20th century. The looming threat of its absence means that it will transform us again, from people who are at home in the petrol cultures we have devised for ourselves, to creatures who will have to shape themselves to contexts and landscapes they can barely imagine. Living with, oil, living with oil only very recently became an interesting problem for social theory. This is proving difficult to do. This is an eminent, by the way. It's part of the playground apparatus there. If, you, uh, if you're a kid and you want to go outside, you can play with swings. You can also play with the uh, pump jack. Living with oil only recently, only very recently, became an interesting problem for social theory. Already the challenge has shifted to imagining what living after oil means for history. If the first transformation happened largely without us realizing it, the second transformation, the one away from fossil fuels to some other social form, will only take place if we make it happen. It may be that the delayed, deferred political revolution that has haunted the modernity will demand changes very different than we had ever expected. Actually, existing socialism and capitalist liberalism have been both enabled by ever greater levels of per capita energy use, a luxury we are unlikely to have for the social political revolution demanded today by the state of the environment, as much as by the social injustices that still comprise life on the planet today. What I'm presenting today, then, is nothing less, perhaps, than the conditions for a social political revolution one that requires a new political language, a language uh, perhaps of things like energy inequalities and energy commons. So let me say it again, and as directly as possible. To be modern is to, I can talk about this afterwards, the one Latin American connection I could think of. <laughs> to be modern is to depend on the capacities and abilities generated by fossil fuels. Without the forms of energy to which we've had access and which we come to take for granted, we would have never been modern. This strong equation of energy and modernity has two consequences for social theory and our concept of history. First, it necessitates a fundamental reconsideration of our understanding of the forces that have given shape to modernity. Our dominant narrative of the modern combines the expansion of rights and freedoms, the advent of scientific insights and technological innovations, and the ballooning of capitalist economies. Holding these very different spheres of social life together, however, however uh, uneasily, under the sign of progress. The work of critical theory in the humanities and social sciences has been to pull apart the clunky, if effective, apparatus of, an, of this enlightened modernity, exposing the multiple fictions of this narrative in order to expose the truths of the modern, buried in, beneath the shiny drama of progress. The drama, in other words, that proclaims that each year is bigger, richer, freer, better than the one before it. That rights and freedoms, when and where they exist at all, have to take place through a process of Kantian maturation rather than be enabled all at once, points to the limits of a liberalism born in the Industrial Revolution rather than speaking to its supposed self-evidence. And as studies of European imperialism in the modern world system have repeatedly shown, the progress and growth of the global north has been made possible only by centuries of exploitation of the people and resources of the global south. These important critiques of modernity have nevertheless left a key element out of our understanding of the modern, which is energy. Economic growth, and so too the expansion of access to the goods and services we have come to associate with the experience of modernity are, and I'll say as strongly as possible, are a direct consequence of the massive expansion of energy use by human communities, especially, though not only in the global north. The capacities and freedoms that are connected to the modern, from the opening up of leisure time to expectations of almost unfettered mobility, are similarly the consequence of a world awash in the kilocalories generated primarily by fossil fuels. While the story of modernity isn't reducible to the use of energy on an ever greater scale, an account of its developments, transgressions, and contradictions that fails to address the role played by energy in shaping its infrastructures, 
for instance, cities designed around automobiles, or its subjectivities, mobile consumers with near infinite powers, including the superhuman ability to reach any point on the planet in a day, and everything else in between. An account, this account, an account of modernity that don't, doesn't include such things can't help but misrepresent the forces and processes shaping historical development, especially over the past two centuries. That access to and the struggle over energy has had a role in shaping modern geopolitics is evident. Witness the role played by access to oil in shaping conflict in the Second World War, or the protracted struggle over power in Africa and the Middle East. What is less evident, however, is the degree to which the energy riches of the past two centuries have influenced our relationship to our bodies, molded human social relations, and impacted the imperatives of even, these very, of even those very activities we grouped together under the term culture. In his essay, A Short History of Oil Cultures, Frederick Buell maps how the dialectic of exuberance and catastrophe, characteristic of modernity, has found its way into culture. And this is his quote. In popular and also high cultural discourse, people's bodies and psyches are refigured as oil electric energized systems, and avant garde artists become the experts who most aggressively convert these energetics into new styles, new aesthetics, new poetics. End quote. Culture, in other words, is imbricated in the same energy system as the economy. I made a similar point in, in, a, in a past issue of PMLA, arguing that instead of challenging the fiction of surplus, as we may, might have hoped or expected, literature participates in it just as surely as every other social narrative of the contemporary era. Ever more narrative, ever more signification, ever more grasping after social meaning. What literature shares with the Enlightenment and capitalism is the implicit longing for the plus beyond what is. We might come at this from the standpoint of population growth too. In the modern era, the rapid expansion of humans on the planet from an estimated population of 1 billion in 1800 to 7.3 billion this year has been facilitated by, perhaps even animated by, growth in the availability and accessibility of energy and its secondary products, <coughs> such as fertilizers from fossil fuels. And this, more people each using more and more energy, has in turn had a decisive impact on the environment. The second consequence of adding energy to our accounts of the modern experience is that it offers us a new vantage point on global warming and environmental crisis. One of the principal causes of global warming has been the emissions of CO2 produced by the burning of large quantities of fossil fuels. I know this is no surprise to anybody here, but I think it has to be said as directly as possible. The problem of global warming is at core an energy problem. The link between energy use and global warming is perhaps obvious. The operations of industrial capitalism and the civilization it brought into existence have had a deleterious impact on the global environment. It makes sense that there will be a focus in environmental studies on shifts in how we employ fossil fuels, that is, switching from coal to natural gas, or on, or on transitions away from fossil fuels to forms of renewable energy. But too often, these changes are envisioned as narrowly technical ones. Much of the contemporary discussion about energy in relation to the environment imagines energy as an input into modern social and material processes that doesn't really alter their character very much, if at all. It's seen as little more that is energy than the gas that runs the engine of a society whose shape and form is largely independent of it. But just as energy is essential to a fuller understanding of modernity, its critical role in shaping existing social structures, lived and material infrastructures, and even critical practices points to those sites in which change will have to take place if we are to address global warming. Even if it envisions difficult, large-scale shifts in the dominant source of energy, the existing language of energy transition is most often defensive. It's insisting on changes in input, in input alone in order to preserve global capitalism and its systems of property and profit. So what do we need to do to get past that? As an increasing number of scientists have insisted, the challenge of addressing global warming isn't fundamentally a scientific or technological one. 
Environmental scientists have played a crucial role in identifying the causes and consequences of global warming, including projections of what might occur if we fail to keep increases in global temperature to less than 2 degrees Celsius, as it appears we're proposed to do if we have no rain. However, the next steps in addressing the environmental crisis will have to come from the humanities and social sciences, from those disciplines that have long attended to the intricacies of social processes, the nature and capacity of, of political change, and the circulation and organization of symbolic meaning through culture. This constitutes an enormous challenge and one that we've barely begun to take up. What we need to do is first grasp the full intricacies of our imbrication with energy systems, fossil fuels in particular, and second, map out other ways of being, behaving, and belonging in relation to both old and new forms of energy. The task I'm proposing is nothing less than to reimagine modernity, and in the process to figure ourselves as different kinds of beings than the ones who have built the civilization on the promises, intensities, and fantasies of a particularly dirty and destructive form of energy. The refigurations to which the work of what has recently come to be called the energy humanities draw attention, the refigurations to which it draws attention go beyond changes to driving habits or the establishment of stricter policies on emissions and the energy efficiency of new homes. The more difficult challenges are those that are hard to see, name, or grasp those zones of experience and expectation generated by our energy systems, which we take as equivalent to normal life. What might well be described as the energy dimension, sorry, uh, uh, the, the energy dimension of the spontaneous consent of hegemony. The sharpest critics working today on the concatenation of oil and on culture explore the depths of being in relation to our era's dominant forms of energy. Energy systems are shot through with largely unexamined cultural values, with ethical and ecological consequences, writes my colleague, who would never allow me to mispronounce her name like this, but I'm not, she's not here, so I get to. Uh, writes Stephanie Limenanger in Living Oil. Buell, who I, re who I uh, referenced before, argues that, quote, it has become impossible not to feel that oil at least partially determines cultural production and reproduction on many levels. Nowadays, energy is more than a constraint. It remains an essential prop underneath humanity's material and symbolic cultures." End quote. The degree to which energy has shaped modern forms of life and ways of being mean, means that the energy humanities have to be seen as more than just a specialist field of study, a subset of environmental human studies, for instance. The claim I'd like to make is a stronger one. The mansion of modern freedom stands on an ever-expanding base of fossil fuel use, writes Deepesh Chakrabarty. Most of our freedoms are energy intensive, he writes. Anyone interested in understanding the material, social, and symbolic operations of an issue as important as human freedoms must take into account the significance of energy in enabling the very possibility of these freedoms, and must certainly do so if they want to grapple with their continuation or extension in an era of environmental challenges and diminishing energy resources. Every evocation of Rousseau or Jefferson today needs to be accompanied by information on per capita energy use and knowledge about the sources and implications of this energy configuration for the operations of politics at every scale, from, the personal, from personal politics to geopolitics. Like any new era of research, Recent explorations of energy and society build on earlier studies that have addressed the social and cultural import of fossil fuels. Lewis Mumford's, Mumford's influential 1934 book, Techniques in Civilization, should be Technics, was among the first books to attend to the social impacts of, in, social impacts of shifts in energy, recognizing the broad changes produced by for example, the movement from coal-fired steam power to the electric motors that were emerging in the 1930s. In his 1943 essay, Energy and the Evolution of Culture, anthropologist Leslie White linked cultural development directly with the amount of energy available to human communities. His attention to the link between the ever greater use of fossil fuels and the expansion of social systems was repeated in anthropological studies following the 1973 oil crisis 
and again in the past few years in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. In early environmental studies, E.J. Schumacher's influential book, uh, 1973 book, Small is Beautiful, a study of economics as if people mattered, begins by noting the short and long-term consequences of the ever-expanding use of fossil fuels, a source of fuel that isn't renewable, and which generates pollution and reinforces capitalism's insistence that bigger is better. The connections that have been repeatedly drawn between the growth in the size of human communities and the growth in their economies has a long tradition of critical analysis. Another work we can mention in this vein is Jean-Claude Debert, Jean-Paul uh, Deleige, and Daniel M. Adley's book, In the Surgery of Power, 1986. So there's this long connection, the one whose force and effectivity has ebbed and waned along with the price of energy and the difficulty of keeping the social import of fossil fuels front and center for academics and publics alike. What distinguishes contemporary critical attention to energy and fossil fuels is the growing recognition that we now fully inhabit the difficult circumstances of which Mumford, White, and other critics forewarned. Fossil fuels are in ever greater demand at a moment when there are anxieties, when there are anxieties about its long -term, their long-term availability, as well as environmental challenges to their necessity and legitimacy. And so energy is on our minds as never before. While there are fluctuations in the demand for oil at any given moment, even in the best case scenario outlined recently by the World Energy Council, we can expect to use 27% more energy in 2050 than today. At the same time, the most recent report from the Emission Database for Global Atmosphere Research suggests that annual global emissions of CO2 have increased significantly since the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992, an agreement whose aim was to have had the opposite outcome. The difficult coordinates of our own circumstance do not stop there. Access to energy is a key component of development. Those countries whose citizens currently use significantly less energy than the average European or North American have expectations of using more. So as to gain the capacities and opportunities that the energy super consumers of advanced industrial economies enjoy. The figures detailing per capita energy usage offer a stark reminder of the planet's discrepancies. Um, the U.S. Energy Information Administration reports in 2012, for instance, that a resident of the U.S. used 313 million BTUs of energy per capita. In Haiti, the figure is 3.13 million, a 100-fold difference. While some of this energy will come in the form of renewables, some of the energy that will, that will be used by, in, in developing countries the infrastructures and mechanisms supporting global modernity continue to require the use of fossil fuels, which means that in large part, the development of the global south requires the increased use of fossil fuels. In the tension established between north and south, and between oil producers and consumers, the opening decades of the 21st century are unwittingly establishing the conditions for an expansion and intensification of geopolitical conflict around energy something about which global political and economic elites seem aware, at least to some minor degree, but about which they seem inclined to do relatively little. The, the, this gap between knowledge and action is important in how we figure the next step, steps in environmental politics. Despite ample evidence to the contrary, there's continued belief and expectation that scientific evidence will, of its own accord, communicate and so trigger the social and political changes needed to address climate change. This is one of the hoped for outcomes of such expansive collections of scientific expertise as the IPCC, whose fifth iteration brought together the work of thousands of scientists and reported that it is quote unquote extremely likely, that is 95 to 100% probability that humans are the dominant cause of global warming. And yet, as more and more scholars are coming to recognize Quantification of global environmental threats through scientific research has, in the words of Sverker Sorlin, failed to affect anything resembling the radical change likely to be required in order to avert environmental catastrophe. The frustrating impasses that have appeared in naming environmental problems have characterized the communication and analysis of energy as well. In his book, Carbon Nation, fossil fuels in the making of American culture, historian Bob Johnson reminds us that, 
quote, we industrial peoples have preferred to keep our energy dependencies out of sight. One of the issues explored by many of the contributors to uh, a forthcoming book called Energy Humanities that my colleague Dominic Boyer and I are just finishing up is the structure and function of what might be termed energy epistemologies. Energy in general, but fossil fuels in particular, have been surprisingly hard to figure narratively, visually, and conceptually as what I've been claiming it is, a central element of the modern. Petroleum firms have been amongst that transition, sorry. Petroleum fir firms have been, been amongst the biggest companies in the world since the modern advent of oil, and they remain so even in an era of computers and social media. An alarming array of everyday goods without which we might find it hard to live are made up of petroleum byproducts. The list of products made from petroleum include all kinds of things, ink, tires, vitamin capsules, eyeglasses, footballs, detergents, parachutes, pantyhose, aspirin, dyes, yarns, nail polish, plastics, dentures, bandages, linoleum, hair coloring, surfboards, in a word, everything. And the geopolitics of the modern era, especially in the, in the period following, for, following World War II, have been decisively shaped by the struggle over access to and control over fossil fuels. And yet despite this, recent critical scholarship has had to account for the ways for ways in which fossil fuels have managed to hide in plain sight, evading inclusion in our economic calculations as much as, say, in our literary fictions. Recent film fiction and visual arts, like the, the images I've been showing here, have begun to explore the character of our energy epistemologies with the aim of grasping the curious invisibility of such a powerful substance as oil, while also trying to render fuels nameable, readable, and visible. One of the takeaways of research that has already been carried out in the energy humanities is a broader understanding of, of the peculiar, if hitherto unremarked, philosophical characteristics of fossil fuels, and perhaps two of, of the dominant energy source of any given era. If it has been so difficult to grasp and grapple with so important an element, it is, it is in many respects because fossil fuels are saturated into every aspect of our social substance. The dark black ink, inky liquid that we sometimes encounter as oil is in fact a ruse. It gives away this obvious sign of itself, dead and harmless, so that it might all the more powerfully inhabit and shape the modern under the cover and with the force of its own darkness. How we might use the critical insights pr provided by research in energy humanities, how might we use the critical insights provided by research in energy humanities to develop a different relationship to energy and to fossil fuels. One beginning point is to consider how we have imagined our relation to history. I'm going to say some things that are ridiculous, but in the, in the, uh, for the sake of time, let me say them. We've tended to allow history to just happen to us, at least when it comes to energy. In the modern period, this is in part due to, due to our faith in the forward and upward pull of technology, and in part to the calculus of progress that insists that we will, by the force of march, by the forward march of time alone, be better off than our predecessors. This isn't to say, of course, that history hasn't been shaped and guided by those with the vested interest in retaining or attaining power, and equally by those who wish to challenge and unnerve social, political, and economic privilege. But what we haven't done, or perhaps haven't had to do before now, is to take on the collective challenge of planning what comes next and in the fullest way possible. In the context of a now almost universally accepted faith in free markets and distributed systems, the suggestion of something akin to central planning can't help but evoke images and fears of failed, clunky Soviet-era plans to increase collective prosperity and reshape reshape subjectivities at the same time. Yet, it is very difficult to see how we might engage in the energy transition we need without plans that bring together scientific knowledge about the causes <coughs> and consequences of global warming with social and cultural insights into the shape and character of our oil subjectivities. To date, the hope has been that market forces will, if managed properly, address the self-same problems they've generated. This has been in large measure the official response to climate change, 
as represented by the Kyoto Agreement and the follow-up series of international summits that resulted in the UN Climate Change Conference in Paris in 2015. <clears throat> Assigning a cost to CO2 emissions might well help slow down the increasing warmth of the atmosphere, at least somewhat, but placing one's faith in environmental change in a market system built around growth and profit, endless expansion in the bottom line, and one furthermore premised in a fundamental way on disavowing or negating the value of natural systems is questionable, to say the least. At the heart of the energy humanities is a political project unlike any we've encountered before. <laughs> there may have been a coal capitalism, and, an, and there certainly is an oil capitalism, but there cannot be a solar and wind capitalism. As Daniel Tenuro points out, this is his quote, generalized commodity production has brought humanity so close to the abyss that a new long wave, of, long wave of growth, whether green, selective, or left wing, would result in a dreadful climate shift, end quote. Tenora argues that the, that the demands of energy transition and global warming necessitate that Marxists, too, abandon productivist accounts of development in imagining post-fossil fuel societies and economies. As we figure out how to no longer be oil subjects inhabiting destructive petrocultures, we will need to undertake a socio-political revolution that is necessary and unavoidable. I have no idea what I'm competing with outside. But what will this revolution look like? Energy provides us with a vector to newly imagined societies defined by an equality by by quality of opportunities and capacities. Communities in which for the first time in history, we are always already attuned to our relations to natural systems. For instance, what if our political freedoms were now to come with a material component, an equality of kilocalories, or British thermal units assigned to each individual, determined in part by how much energy the planet could bear? Are there ways in which newfound attention to energy might reinvigorate our politics? allowing us to position our material demands and impact on the planet at the core of social quality. The revolution that energy could produce would need to attend to more than just the sharing of kilocalories. In his uh, seldom read essay, I think, Nature and Revolution, Herbert Marcuse writes, and this is an extended quote, our world emerges not only in the pure form of time and space, but also and simultaneously as a totality of sens sensuous qualities, object not only of the eye, but of all human senses, hearing, smelling, touching, tasting. It is this qualitative elementary unconscious, or rather pre-conscious, constitution of the world of experience. It is this primary experience itself which must change radically if social change is to be radical qualitative change. Critical theory has sought to draw our attention to multiple ways in which we are other than we imagine ourselves to be. For instance, as revealed by Marx's critique of political economy or Freud's analysis of political subject, and so on. And to this, we might now need to add an account of something like an energy unconscious. Our everyday practices and activities have been shaped by energy in a way that we've never fully understood. <coughs> if we are to be able to address the environmental challenges we currently face, we need to understand that something like primary experience, in Marx, Marcuse's account, has been constituted by fossil fuels. If one aspect of our revolutionary transition will concern the social uses of energy, another will, reconf will refigure the coordinates of our primary experience, doing away with, for instance, the fun fundamental divide between human and nature on which the modern has been built. To move forward, our critical work will also have to push past our inherited categories of analysis and action. <clears throat> Bruno Latour's noted, for example, that the critique of enlightened, enlightened rationality that once fueled critical theory has inadvertently played into the hands of climate change deniers and neo-racist ideologues. Other scholars have noted how our epistemic tools for revolution and redemption are deeply entangled with the magnitudes of energy promised by fossil fuels. Still more unsettling questions have been raised by materialist feminist scholars who argue that even terms like Anthropocene can reproduce the conditions of anthropocentrism they purport to analyze. 
Stacey Alimo writes, for example, that we should consider how easily Anthropocene, in this, these are her words, quote, becomes enlisted in all too familiar formulations of epistemologies and defensive maneuvers, modes of knowing and being that are utterly incapable of adequately responding to the cataclysmic complexities of the Anthropocene itself, end quote. Anthropocene even contains a veneer of, oops, of species pride. Um, in its geo-ontological formulation, which is figured around an implicit sense that no other species could affect the life world of all other species. And Claire Colebrook asks whether even the post-human race of living systems might not be, these are her words, a way of avoiding the extent to which man is a theoretical animal, a myopically and malevolently self-enclosed machine whose world he will always view as present for his own education. One generative response to such concerns, as Don, Don Haraway has recently suggested, <coughs> is to further diversify our critical conceptual resources for interrogating our, our current ecological condition, while also resolutely committing ourselves to, and these are her words, to join forces to reconstitute refuges, to make possible partial and robust biological, cultural, political, technological recuperation and recomposition, which must include mourning irreversible losses. I view the rise of the energy humanities as part of this project of recuperation and recomposition. As fragile, rather than omnipotent creatures, Homo sapiens have long sought to harness other forms of energy to magnify and extend their capacities. As that harnessing intensified with the mastery of the enormous energetic, energetic potential of fossil fuels, <coughs> human industry accelerated, creating more and more machines, institutions, expectations and practices dependent on new energy magnitudes. That acceleration has led us to the brink of ecological catastrophe. Not all humans share equal culpability in this process, of course. We must interrogate the we that is the subject of climatological and ecological responsibility, as I think we've been doing so fantastically in this uh, workshop. Only certain populations in the world grow the, the globalization of fuel-intensive life, and they did so through centuries of colonizing violence. More than that, northern white masculinity continues to epitomize the apex species logic of entitlement that has brought us to our current situation. The Anthropocene has, in other words, always been the Anthropocene. Energy humanities thus retains a deep kinship and intimate conversation with environmental humanities, particularly with the path-breaking efforts of materials feminist thinkers to deliver new critical intellectual resources for understanding and remediating the biotic, social, cultural, and political dimensions of human and non-human life. The point of what I've been calling the energy humanities, which means that we have to add energy to all of our calculations and understandings of everything, a big demand, is not to constitute, I hope not, at least to constitute a new explanatory determinism that can then be used to dominate other analytics into submission. The point is rather to turn, to turn phenomena such as global warming, species extinction, environmental degradation inside out, so as to reveal how the use and abuse of energy has contributed to the making of uh, what Anand Singh terms the damaged planet. It is today essential to shed light on the fuel apparatus of modernity that is all too often invisible or subterranean, but which pumps and seeps into the groundwaters of politics, culture, institutions and knowledges in unexpected ways. Moreover, energy humanities aspires to provide a speculative impulse as well as critical <coughs> diagnostics. There is a place for sober criticism and discussion in the enterprise of energy humanities. There's also a place for surreal vision and wild imagination. It will take all the capacities of the arts and humanities to help transform this modernity, to push us toward conversations and collaborations we've long waited to have with one another about what we want this century to become. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, what a great talk. I just want to start talking about your talk, actually, but um, I'll try not to do that and try to focus on my own here. I do want to um, definitely thank uh, Priscilla for that amazingly generous uh, 
introduction and for the invitation to come speak here and to thank um, everyone for the conversations all day, which I've really appreciated and learned a great deal from. And actually, my own work, not what I'm talking about today, but my own work prior to this does actually fit with some of the things that have been talked about today. Um, that image that uh, Fernando Arias started out with, with the, the dishwasher, that very mundane scene of the dishwasher, and then also then the concept of the cuerpo territorio, or the, um, this uh, bodily territory, those two things sort of combined are a bit parallel to my concept of transcorporeality in bodily natures, although that's very much um, from a sort of um, uh, Western industrialized perspective of trying to transform ethical and political models uh, by thinking of environmentalism as precisely how our everyday practices are immersed within the material world. So there, I saw some um, some interesting parallels actually with some of the things that were um, spoken about earlier uh, today. Um, what I'm turning to now, however, is um, a lot of projects that I've been doing lately, uh, basically about the deep seas. And one of the reasons for me to switch from um, transcorporeality and material feminisms and new materialisms to the deep oceans was I was trying to imagine how far could I get from my own concepts because I think when you get when you need to when you're starting on a new project it's really useful to try to run as far away as you can from what you've been thinking about for the last 10 years and do something really different I thought well you know the bottom of the ocean that's pretty far away from say that dishwasher image or something right the bottom of the sea you can't get much further away from that conceptually but more importantly, I do think that we need to develop different models for the blue humanities, marine science studies, and other ways of bringing um, the, the oceans into um, environmental politics, but also um, environmental thought more generally. And this is a really important time because on the one hand, you have something like the Census of Marine Life, that, that global project that took 10 years and they, uh, found all sorts of new creatures in the seas and tr tried to, they had this impossible task of trying to figure out what was actually in the ocean, what, how, what lives there and how many, which of course they knew they couldn't do, but, but all of that information is has come out. And there's this strange sort of anachronistic race. So here we are in this, the midst of the sixth great extinction, and yet we have this incredibly anachronistic situation of discovery of new creatures even as they're, they're barely being discovered before they're already extinct by the very technologies that have moved deeper and deeper into the ocean. So the ocean is in great peril. Actually, Emory showed in one of his slides the marine fish catch has um, transformed by 35 times. Magnitude of 35 was on his slide. So ima imagine that scale. Um, things like long lines, deep sea trawling, um, if you don't want, know what any of these things are, I'm happily, happy to explain that afterwards. Um, something like um, the bycatch rates, bycatch rates in the fishing industries, do you know what that is? Those can be from 70 to say 95%, which means 95% of the creatures that are killed, say with the long lines, dolphins, um, birds, fish, everything is thrown back as garbage because they're only fishing for one kind of fish that they're going to serve. So now I, I work in, um, I don't work in Latin American studies, I don't work in decolonial or postcolonial studies, but this ocean project does have a kind of frame or horizon around it when you think about the fact that just as with climate change, the people most hurt by these practices would be the people furthest removed from them. So if you think of all of the people on the planet who rely upon the ocean on a small scale, where they're going out themselves and fishing on a small scale, and that's been their livelihood, and then what's destroying the oceans by and large um, are things like industrialized fishing, industrialized dumping, a lot of the first world practices. So there is a kind of framework here um, that does look at those inequities, although that's not what I'm talking about directly. So what I'm going to talk about is, um, well, basically I was invited to write for a project called Fear, and we had to have a verb. And we were supposed to keep making the verb be a verb and not a noun. So there's a sort of um, 
you know, commanding you to unmoor throughout the talk. So, you know, you can participate in that mentally, I suppose, here. Um, and my talk is pretty short. I kept it short knowing I would be the last one and that you wouldn't want me to go on too long. So it's actually, I've given you a big framework in the introduction, but the talk itself is pretty short. But I'm happy to talk about all sorts of other ocean writings that I've been working on. Oh, so basically, basically the point of it is this larger question of uh, sort of theoretical question of what does it mean to develop a kind of philosophical blue humanities. Um, and I will say, actually, this oddly echoes on something that Imre just said, because I was thinking about what is the role of humanities. And one of the things that I came up with was speculation, right? But for me, I think that with, with some of the ocean um, science that's coming out, one of the things that people in, in theory and the humanities can do is a kind of speculation with that scientific information as it's coming out. And so the unmoor is basically asking that question of what, your, what our frames would be. <clears throat> I had to put Homer in there because I was writing for these medievalists and you know, I'm a late 20th century person and I'm, they've adopted me for some weird reason so I have to try to you know, do what I can. Okay. Rushing into the sea. Oh, and I apologize. I have a very bad cold and cough. And if you can't hear me, just just let me know. Rushing into the sea in a mad dash to conjure up concern for ocean ecologies that face accelerating threats. A blue ecocultural studies must first unmoor. What ties must be loosened when environmentalism, with its terrestrial grounding, becomes submerged? Two-dimensional maps flatten and distort as marine habitats must be comprehended through vertical dimensions. Many species traverse depths crossing great distances in all directions. National boundaries do not extend to most waters, diluting conservation policy, legislation, and enforcement. The tragedy of the commons cannot be lamented as a mere historical relic, but is instead happening now in the largely unregulated open seas. The wilderness ideal, however problematic, which has infused much environmentalism in the U.S., is invoked when hailing the deep seas as the last great wilderness. But the wilderness is a dreadfully anachronistic concept where the temperatures and acidity of seawaters have been humanly altered and so much has been taken out of and dumped into the oceans. Sustainability paradigms, which assume the ocean is a resource for human use, are readily adopted to promote business as usual, even though targets such as sustainable seafood seem desperate delusions when considered within burgeoning evidence of collapsing marine ecologies. Marine biology, especially that of the deep seas, has lagged behind terrestrial biology in its understanding of ecological interrelations, in part because of the great difficulty of observation, sampling, and fieldwork in the depths. Furthermore, ethical paradigms from animal studies are put under pressure in the sea. Salps, sea cucumbers, sponges, and corals, for example, can hardly be considered as, in Haraway's terms, companion species, even though they are, of course, significantly other. Humans may think with them, but not live with them. We cannot trace embodied, co-constitutive relations or cultivate playful, respectful interaction with, say, the blobfish, <laughs> despite its uncanny humanoid face. And this is the Census of Marine Life. Their website is fabulous. I have, I have two chapters about them in, in my next book, and there's so much there. It's just, I could talk forever about them. But who doesn't love the blobfish? <laughs> okay. Conversely, Categorizing sea creatures as weirdly alien rather than companions expels or objects these species from territories of human concern. And I'm gonna, since I know my talk is really short, I am gonna do a really quick rant about James Cameron and how much I hate him. Because uh, Cam, Cameron is all about, he does all these things with the deep seas, and it always has, whether it's a, it's a, documentary or science fiction or his own trip it is always the same it's always okay we're going to go to the bottom of the sea 
And what will we find at the bottom of the sea? We will find space, outer space, space aliens. And so for me as a feminist, a Western feminist, there's this whole trajectory where, you know, here, supposedly he's submerging. Oh no, it has to be about transcending. It always ends in transcendence in outer space with aliens. So this one, this is a documentary where a science, she is a scientist, and she reaches out at the end, and a real self that goes by, which is unbelievably beautiful, cool and weird and amazing enough, has to then turn into a stupid alien at the end. Like, why, why, why? Why isn't the self good enough for you, James Cameron? That's my question. Um, not, not a fan. Um, OK. Rant is done. I will go on. Uh, such, full, such figurations bolster the anachronistic narratives of discovery, James Cameron, that seem to provide a refuge from human culpability. As if we could imagine that creatures in the deep sea exist beyond the reach of anthropogenic harms. Yet these marine species, even the as yet undiscovered, must live in Anthropocene waters that are warming, acidifying, and ravaged by industrialized fishing and mining. The fantasy that the ocean is so immense as to be untouched by human incursions and the temptation to enjoy oceanic feelings or other states of marine bliss may make unmooring into a solipsistic affair, a structure of feeling lacking the ethical or political leverage that would propel ocean conservation projects. Similarly, to unmoor may evoke fantasies of wilderness and wildness, cutting ties and letting go, perhaps to encounter the newly discovered creatures from the deep whose already iconic images stress their weirdness. Wilderness and weirdness may seem to veer away from anthropocentrism, but they may end up reinstating the conventional parameters of the Western human. Despite these warnings to unmoor, begin by imagining life in the depths. Willem Flusser and Louis Beck in Vampiro Tuthis Infernalis, itself a very strange, even unclassifiable, unclassifiable meditation on the vampire squid from hell. Um, if you know this book, it's in a post humanity series with Minnesota. It's written as a this sort of fake scientific treatise. It, it's very difficult to know what to do with it. Um, admit that the human and the octopod live far apart, and yet they insist nonetheless that the vampiratuthis is not entirely alien to us. Our common ancestor means that we harbor some of the same deeply ingrained memories. Notwithstanding evolutionary kinship, it is no small feat to conjure the Dyson of this mollusk to begin to see with its eyes and grasp with its tentacles. Quote, this attempt to cross from our world into its, admittedly, a metaphorical enterprise, but it is not transcendental. We are not attempting to evolve out of the world, but to relocate into another's. Our concern is not with a theory, but with a fable, with leaving the real world for a fabulous one. Metonyms traverse transcorporeal networks, while metaphors demand some kind of imaginative leap. And yet, to unmoor would not be to rise and float in the air, but to descend and hover in the depths, not to dissolve into the ocean as an immense imagined void or abyss, but to grapple with the existence of a multitude of non-human lives in the seas. Departing from Flusser and Beck here, unmooring would not entail, quote, leaving the real world for a fabulous one, since the real could not be more fabulous. Also, their opposition between theory and fable not only seems murky, but a marine science studies should seek to add reality rather than subtract it. You know, in Latour's terms with the clumsy rate waiter, we never, we're never able to add reality. We're always just dropping the dishes and subtracting it. Also, they're um, re referring, uh, returning to Flusser and Beck's insistence that crossing from our world into that of the Vampira Tuthis is not transcendental. transcendental. It is worth noting Donahue J. Haraway's critique of the God trick of a limitless, objective, disembodied vision, the conquering gaze from nowhere. To unmoor entails such sorts of situated knowledges, veering away from veering away. Except, after grappling with one's own situated epistemological and political positioning, 
one would still need to engage with the scientific captures of marine life, the terribly mediated, compromised, yet sometimes passionate accounts of creaturely lives in the depths. Unmoor by practicing informed, intentioned speculation about other creatures' perspectives, modes of being, and life worlds. Sit with these speculations long enough to shift the terrains of environmental concern, to include even the still as yet unknown species of the deep seas. But then, cut away from any sense of certainty, except that which insists other creatures cannot be contained within human conceptions. Even the familiar cat next to Derrida, seeing him naked, darts away from conceptualizations. Quote, nothing can ever rob me of the certainty that what we have here is an existence that refused to be conceptualized. A rebel à tout concept. Despite Emily Dickinson's musings, the brain is not deeper than the sea. The brain cannot absorb it because there is no it there, no sea as such whatever that as such could even mean. But instead, multitudes of interacting species, ecologies, substances, and forces that make marine animal studies, like the marine sciences, a formidable venture. Drawing on phenomenology rather than Haraway and other feminist epistemologists who could be cited here, Michael Martyr in Plant Thinking, A Philosophy of Vegetal Life, contends that, quote, the spatiality of all living beings unmoored from their objective determinations and emancipated from a global disincarnated perspective that disavows its own perspectivalism will require that a different sense of what is above and what is below be laboriously worked out from the standpoint of each particular life form in question. It's a tall order. Contemplating such a multi-species spatiality would be vertiginous enough on land, but to descend with these transmogrifying seascapes may be akin to the vertigo, giddiness, anxiety, and intoxication of nitrogen narcosis. As not only space, but time may warp, twist, and ripple away. Jakob von Uxkel considered the standpoint of different animals, proposing that even space and time are relative to each creature. For the deep sea medusa, which moves in constant rhythm, for example, the same bell always tolls, and this controls the rhythm of life. Dorian Sagan's introduction to Uxkel's foray into the world of animals and humans notes that while literature, shamanic traditions, Tibetan Buddhism, and Vulcan mind melding, he included that, not me, promote the art of putting oneself in another's shoes. Such explorations, such embodiments, he says, remain rare in scientific literature. Sagan's account of these practices does to some degree assume the very self-other binary it would subvert, as such categories persist in Western thought. Elizabeth de Lowry presents an alternative conception from Maori epistemology, where to know is to locate within a genealogy called Waka Papa. She says, quote, because Waka Papa incorporate the subject into planetary networks of kinship, including Tangaroa, the deity of the ocean, knowing and being are constitutive and interrelated. It's doubtful that Western subjects would trace planetary kinship networks, even though evolutionary origin stories of life beginning in the sea are frequently invoked by ocean conservationists and scientists like Sylvia Earle and a lot of others. The question of the relationship between knowing and being remains central, in my view, to a post-humanist, new materialist conception of a blue science studies that veers into or begins with a marine animal studies so as not to end up in the ocean as a void. To unmoor, to set off for an oceanic animal studies would require imagining the lives and worlds of myriad marine species with a million or more species in the ocean and many more that are not yet discovered, to unmoor by conjuring fabulously creaturely lives would be an immense praxis. Would such a praxis be compositionist in Bruno Latour, Latour's terms as it proceeds from the knowledge that the ocean is not nature in the modernist sense, since it is not always already assembled, but must be composed, quote, from discontinuous pieces? Certainly, and this very sense of things is often echoed, though in very different terms, 
by many marine scientists and ocean conservationists when they stress that the new discoveries in ocean science, from new species to ocean acidification, happen within a context in which so little is known that all must be composed from discontinuous pieces that are rather hard won. But Latour's quest for that, quote, common world, even though it is, quote, slowly, slowly composed instead of being taken for granted and imposed on all, still suggests a unified transcendental perspective from which humans assemble and contemplate the arrangement of pieces. While Latour rejects inanimism and distributes agencies to non-humans, the figuration of the common world erases power dynamics and the multiple perspectives of different groups of humans and non-humans, positing that everything happens as if the human race were on the move again, expelled from one utopia, that of economics, and in search of another, that of ecology. Latour ignores much of the human race, who would find that historical trajectory incomprehensible. When he asks, quote, how can a livable and breathable home be built for those errant masses, the reference to Icos, the root of ecology, makes it possible to include non-humans, and yet the emphasis on building, or worse, building for, may suggest stationary structures rather than multi-species habitats, agencies, and ecologies. The search for the common culminates with a domestic air, an enterprise that is too human and too terrestrial. One more by thinking with the deep sea Medusa or thousands of other submerged uncommon lives that may move with currents and tides. Veering away from standard modes of scientific objectivity that reduce, that reduce the investigations of marine animals akin to an autopsy of a lifeless body, Plusser and Beck warn that fables should not be woven of scientific texts and yet they admit that they have little choice but to rely on the contents of scientific literature. Blue ecologies generally, as well as marine animal studies, must be modes of science studies, reflectively encountering, reflectively encountering, encountering sorry, mediated scientific captures, whether these be images, data, hypotheses, results, arguments, or narratives. To contemplate or theorize about abyssal or even pelag pelagic ecologies would be unthinkable without marine biology and its technologies, as ordinary people or citizen scientists cannot access the depths themselves. Nor would we expect to find much traditional ecological knowledge about the deep sea, given that humans cannot venture there without submersibles or special dive suits. Tales of sea monsters abound, but such stories often sever connections, alienate rather than mediate or transmit something about actual species. Flusser and Beck imagine sciences that serve as luminescent organs, adorning fabulous tentacles with which the vampire toothist one hopes can be felt. This tentacular science with glowing organs will have been shaped by its object of inquiry as it bears itself to being touched by the creature it would know. The vampira toothus would ideally be felt. The ostensibly objective eye of science, which reduces lives, substances, and environments to objects, is reimagined as a biomorphic receptivity that is itself aesthetically lavish. The luminescent organs participate in the festivities rather than remotely recording them. Marine biologist Edith Witter, for example, in Sly Eye for the Shy Guy, developed with engineers a luminescent organ called the Eye in the Sea. And this is a camera that uses far, let, far red light to remain unobtrusive, but features an optical lure that initiates bioluminescent displays. So this Eye in the Sea captured and filmed the giant squid in its natural habitat for the first time in 2013. In her TED talk, refer referencing the video behind her on the screen, she describes what's happening when the electronic jellyfish lit up at 2,000 feet in the Bahamas, sparking more bioluminescent displays. She says, we basically have a chat room going on here because once it gets started, everybody's talking. And I think this is actually a shrimp that's releasing its bioluminescent chemicals into the water. But the cool thing is we're talking to it. We don't know what we're saying. Personally, I think it's something sexy. 
think it's so funny that she thinks that. Um, okay, so Winter, an expert on bioluminescence, has developed other instruments that register light in the deep oceans and trace the distribution of bioluminescent displays. That may sound dry, but what if tentacular science could be a trans-species somatotechnic affair? Evidence that the creatures have been felt by the luminescent organs adorning fabulous tentacles would include Witter's own impassionate responses, the reactions of her audience, and the fact that she co-founded and leads ORCA, the Ocean Research and Conservation Association, advocating for stronger funding for marine science and ocean conservation projects. Veer toward intimate science and impassioned politics. Witter has spent many hours, thousands of feet down, in various submersibles, but it was her first experience in a wasp suit at uh, 880 feet that sparked her addiction to bioluminescence when siphonophores lit up even the inside of her own suit and she was surrounded by puffs and billows of what looked like luminous blue smoke and it was breathtaking. Ellen Prager in Chasing Science at Sea writes that, quote, researchers who study the deep ocean the experience in a submersible can be astonishing, so much that it can be hard to stay focused on science. In these instances, enthusiasm may turn objective scientific narrative into the layperson's words of excitement. Ooh, ah, oh my God, and holy shit are a few of the descriptors that have been uttered under such circumstances, some even recorded for posterity, says uh, Ellen Prager. Few laypersons have the opportunity to experience the deep seas to exclaim, holy shit, unburdened by professional, by professional protocol. There are a few outfits, however, that will take tourists down. So one of these is the, um, the Roatan Institute of Deep Sea Exploration. I don't know if any of you know about this, but the uh, man, uh, Captain Carl Stanley, who at the age of 16 um, in the States started trying to build his own deep sea submersibles. And so he operates out of Rotan because basically they have no rules and no insurance or anything. And so basically, if you, if you die, he dies, everybody dies. But so far, nobody has died. He takes people down very deep. And I had the opportunity to see this thing. It is so small. And I was, I'm, I'm very, I, I'm a scuba diver. I love scuba diving. But I'm so claustrophobic. There's no way you could paint. I mean, you'd have to, I don't know, drug me or something. I could not get in that submersible. It is so small, but I really wanted to go down in it. Oh, I so wanted to do it, but I think I would be, I don't think I'd survive the claustrophobia. Um, okay, so he, I'm not going to talk all about his reactions here. He says that uh, the descent, the descent promises, um, let me see how many. How much more I have? Since I promised you I'd be fast, so I don't have that much more. Okay, so um, he takes people down, and let's see. I say the descent promises encounters with exciting creatures veer from the obvious critique of touristic commodification, colonization, and the spectacle to hear the call to recognize and think with non-human, non-terrestrial modes of life unmoor from academic modes of critique that are saturated with the dry detachment that shields the human from less masterful ethics. Artist Michelle Atherton, who intrepidly took the trip in Stanley's submersible, reflects on her experience. Quote, this is the total blackness of the abyssopelagic zone in which we are descending, totally unmoored from the terrestrial. When lights are turned on, illuminating their surroundings, Atherton experiences an aquatic immensity with no end. Our orientation is scrambled. We've lost all sense of perspective. She explains that in the day-to-day, -day, um, in the deep, the day-to-day -day markers of space and time fall away. She concludes, we lose time, lose ourselves to a state of temporal drift. Unmoor by sinking into the abyssal and benthic realms where there is little to hold on to. <coughs> Veering out the chain in nautical parlance means to slacken it in a controlled manner. This is no inebriated swerve or stumble, but an intentional letting go in order to loosen the confines of the human. As the blue humanities calls to us to unmoor environmental thought from dry terrains, 
we may want to hold on to a certain skepticism regarding blissful oceanic feelings or even modes of philosophical critique that leave political activism without an edge, without leverage, without something to propel change. Floating too freely may be counterproductive. Meta Grilda and Nina Luca warn at the end of Cosmo Dolphins that self-abandoning vis-a-vis the wild other is a destructive mode of denial that ignores the fact that we do have some opportunities for subjective and socio-technical intervention. Some of those interventions would entail the imposition of boundaries on what we relish as unbounded in the form of the creation and enforcement of marine protected areas, which would ideally protect even the sea vents, the deep sea mounts, and the sea floor, which is going to be mine soon for uh, manganese model nodules and other things. The deep seas are certainly not alien to industrial fishing operations, or the companies planning to mine seabeds. Capitalist and neo-colonialist mappings annex rather than expel these zones. Blue humanities and ocean conservation movements need to reckon with the particular challenges the deep seas face and relish the fabulous diversity of marine species while avoiding conceptual maps that alienate. If there is to be an environmentalism, an activism, a philosophical, artistic, poetic reckoning with the scale of human alteration of the deep waters of the planet, it will require figurations that grapple with the realities of marine ecologies as they are continually being composed and recomposed and translate them in ways that are culturally and politically potent. To unmoor means not only to sever what binds environmental thought to this shore, but to cultivate alternative images, stories, and highly mediated dispatches from the depths, to mobilize enchanting cultural productions that will lure us toward an environmental ethics and politics that can traverse the scale of the seas. Thanks. And Ray, do you want to come up here too? Dahlia's going to do a slight um, response. Oh, so okay. Just oh, okay. I didn't even see that on the. Um, well, we well, I wasn't going to oh, do it. Okay. Oh, I was going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that I think that there's a lot of Mm -hmm. uh, here. Wait, you might be on here. We're going to be longer, each one taking out almost an hour, so we will get time for a response. So I did not prepare my response. And then um, we decided that I would just uh, talk briefly. My name is Dalia Patino Echeverri, and I am an assistant professor at the Nicholas School of Environment, same department as uh, Dan Victor and Peter Half, who was earlier here. Um, our department is very special. It is organized about this, the problem of the environment, and therefore has uh, people from the different disciplines. It has uh, many wonderful um, uh, scientists, natural scientists. It also has social scientists, uh, Perhaps is uh, has the largest body of uh, environmental economists in the in the U.S. and it also has engineers like me. And I'm an, uh, we are the engineer and industrial engineer who uh, from a department that does engineering and uh, public policy. And my topic is um, electricity and uh, energy in in uh, in general and the policies that we need to transition to the energy system that we want. And yes, thank you. And, and the energy, so um, we, uh, the reason I am in a school of environment is because I shared this, that what I understand it was uh, uh, interest point, which is if you care about anything that has happened in history and everything that will come, will you have to ask the question of what, has, what, what is, where are we gonna get our energy from? And similarly, if we care about the environment, then we have to care about energy, um, 
energy is perhaps the, the number one offender on the environment. Uh, but then, if we care about social equity and access to education and access to healthcare and access to uh, all these other things that define our modernity, we have to uh, care about energy access. And we have these two serious problems. So problem number one is that we have uh, 1.5 billion people that have no access to electricity whatsoever and about 3 billion people that have to uh, cook with wood or coal or charcoal or animal waste. Um, heat and cook with those things. And then we have this other problem, that is that in the places where we have abundant energy, we are getting it from the wrong place. It reminds us oil, oil and coal. Um, and what we know is the following. We need to avoid catastrophic climate change. And we have about a 90% chance of avoiding it if we keep our warming below <coughs> 2 centigrade. And limiting those 2 centigrade, we have to stabilize our concentrations in these numbers, 400, 450. And our concentrations now are 380. That says that and we emit about two um, uh, parts per million per year. And that means that we have to reduce emissions by 60% by 2050. And because, and that's also so it comes from Imre's talk, um, not all countries are equally guilty. They don't share the guilt. Then the industrialized countries have to reduce their emissions by 80%. And this is a tremendous challenge. And, and this is um, a figure that illustrates that. A really old point here is like having one large coal plant, like the one in the picture, or, or 120 nuclear power plants, or 36 of the largest 20 uh, wind farms in Texas. That's just one little thing here. And this is how much energy, sorry, um, this is how much energy we have been consuming. And this is where we are today for electricity generation in the US, just in the US. And then this is if we add all the energy we use for industrial <coughs> processes and for residential heating and cooking. And this is if we add all the energy um, for the transportation. And if we want to reduce and decarbonize, become those zero carbon citizens, then we have to do something we have never done. We have, can you see the step, the, the, the steepness of those lines? How fast we need to we, we need to move if we want to accomplish this goal in 20 years or 40 years or 60 years? It's a really tremendous challenge. And and the challenge is not only due because of this pace at which we have to build this new infrastructure. Um, it's also due to many difficulties. We have to first find what is the best infrastructure and then design policies to invest in that infrastructure, in that idea mix. So we don't know what is that idea mix. But if we, even if we know what is the idea mix, we have to come up with a way to do that idea mix. And then we have to come with a way to operate that. And then we have to come up with, a, with understanding what is the kind of human behavior we need. And even if we knew what is the kind of human behavior we need, because we think we know, but we don't know really very well, we would have to make that behavior happen. And that's when the humanities and the arts come into place, because there is, there is, there is you know, two shares of what we have to do is over there. Um, so we have many problems. So the first problem is the problem I, I approach, and is this problem that uh, that we were saying, well, it's the problem of the transformation that we think is this problem of the transformation <coughs> of the geopolitics of this planet. And this problem is very hard for many reasons because these investments that we will make are largely irreversible. And once we build them, they are there forever, for 40, 50, 100 years. <clears throat> and how they perform depends on many uncertainties. And I'm going to show you just a couple of uncertainties. Well, this is, uh, let's just, uh, um, I'm gonna, no, actually. It's hard to choose, to choose which one, and if we wanted, Let's say we wanted um, a system that is reliable, we can we have electricity any, at any time, and it's also affordable, so it's cheap, we would have coal, but that wouldn't be clean, of course. And if we had a system, we wanted a, way, a system that is affordable and clean, and clean, I'll show you, is not clean, but clean only in the sense of air emissions, not everything else, then we, we would have wind, and then if we want the reliable, we would have wind and, and PV um, or PV solar, but we would need batteries, and then we would have much more extractivism, and so, and this wouldn't be affordable, unfortunately. And then we have other sources. 
And when we say clean for, for cold and uh, for not, no, wind and PV, we mean clean only on the very simple stage of um, generating electricity. But we, if we talk about the full life cycle of wind and PV solar, and we remember that everything is connected with everything, which is the very first law of ecology, then we can come up with ingress quote from someone else I, what, who said this quote that any new long wave of growth, whatever that growth is, even if green or selective or left wing or whatever, it would be terrible because any other emissions are happening. So there is there are all these uncertainties, like the projections we made today about how the, we are going to not depend on oil in 100 years, rely on, on predictions of <laughs> prices. And we have done a terrible job predicting prices. This is a prediction of natural gas from the US EIA. The black line is the, the reality, and the other numbers are the other lines are just projections. Every year they put out a projection, and every year we are wrong. So, so we have a lot of uncertainty, and I I love this this paper, and I also I love um, um, Stacy's paper. Um, in that they were both very hopeful and one thing that I that I found fascinating is this 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 idea that we really have to reinvent everything. How do we analyze things and how we act? And so far action hasn't happened and probably that's because of an excess of optimism and pessimism. <laughs> excess on, of optimism because we are hoping that technology. that technology will solve all our problems and then excess of pessimism because we stop acting individually because we think that the, that is a drop in the bucket that whatever we do as an individuals is a, is lost and if we get beyond that and start thinking in these new categories of analysis and action that we may need then i'm sorry then then we we will do it and i think um that's where we need to start to to begin and Recognizing and starting to take advantage of that space that that uh, our speakers say exists, which is also space for the surreal vision and the wild imagination. These are all quotes from Ingrid's talk. He was very kind to me uh, to give me his talk. I think um, it's also the surreal vision and wild imagination connects beautifully with the Stacey's uh, paper. is is showing that we don't even need to imagine it is there. Is is that there is that nature that that we that we have and we need to protect and it's our responsibility to um, to respect and consider, consider sacred. And perhaps that's the new, the new way and the, why the imagination is. Imagine a world where we consider sacred, um, the environment as something sacred. That's, that's it. Okay. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> it's Friday afternoon, 5 uh, 20. Uh, we want to have any reactions, uh, comments. Uh, uh, what's next? Can I say this something really quickly about please, please, so please. so with one of the things about climate change discourse and sustainability discourse is that have bothered me, especially in uh, Bill McKinnon's uh, 350.org, is that there are no other species, right? So I think one of the issues in terms of motivating people to care about any of these things that are represented as abstract or in terms of numbers or levels, I think is a multi-species perspective that has to do with extinction and how many creatures will be lost. And I think our earlier discussion of what is it that motivates people to act? Um, in a class that I taught many years ago on climate change, there was a story about how a particular newt in England was going to go extinct because it wouldn't be able to cross the highway. So when the, the, the climate change changed the territory and it would have to cross the highway and go north in order to survive, it wouldn't be able to cross the highway. That would be it for the newt. And the thing that was amazing to me is all of the different things that we read and watched in this class. It was the story of that newt that got the students. And so they came in, and, and my issue with narrative is I think that narrative doesn't do anything unless it actually can translate into some kind of action. And what those students did then is every day when they walked in the class, they turned off the lights. 
So I have an essay coming out that's called When the Newt Turned Out the Lights, because that's what, somehow it was that newt, but then the students refused to use lights in the classroom because they saw the energy usage of just, it, you put it, I love Emory, that the idea that the hegemony, this, this hegemony of, of energy usage, they refused to participate in that. And so they were just turning off lights all the time. And we had class in the dark because of the newt. And they made that, and even though it's not a direct connection, it's still that sense of every single thing that you're doing does have a kind of impact or will collectively. And that was, that was, a, that was a great moment, I think. And I think that that is something that the humanities can do. But I think we do have to keep the focus on a multi-species perspective and not have it become this sort of scientific abstraction about energy or climate or anything else. Yeah, that was fantastic. I really... Like, I love this panel, it's great. Um, I, you know, I want to challenge a little bit your saying about narr that narrative doesn't do anything until we translate into action. I mean, of course that's true on some level, but thinking is a form of acting, I think. And um, you were talking about knowing, one of you was talking, I think you both were talking in some sense about knowing and being. Mm -hmm. Being, um, you were much more um, interconnected. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, we talk in, after Rob Nixon about slow violence, or earlier, structural violence. Mm -hmm. I right? know those terms, the thing where the, the problem doesn't manifest until later. But what about slow change? Mm -hmm. And I think what narrative does mm -hmm. is ask us to look differently at a problem. You, I mean, that's what you're doing with Blue mm -hmm. Humanities. You're saying, let's look differently at these problems. Let's mm -hmm. immerse and unmoor. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is doing something. And one of the problems might be that we look for change to be too fast, and so we don't mm -hmm. bother to think about change at all. Mm -hmm. And if we think about narrative in relation to slow change, maybe telling the story differently mm -hmm. really is the beginning, and that's the new, right, of, of right. getting there. Right. And I think that's why I think the humanities is foundational. Yeah. Not the science is going to tell us this, and then we're going to get to the point where we figure out, you know, how to fix it. But rather, the science is telling us this, and maybe that's where we should start looking, mm -hmm. right? And so, that's a great point. So I, you know, I'd love to hear you guys speak <coughs> to that. But, but I believe this fervently, and I believe. Well, sorry, I'm going on too long. But one more, one more point of that. I believe that we are, we are, we get into the pessimism because we're looking. Or something to be a full solution or finally get to the truth finally we're going to know and understand the problem and if world history and human history has taught us anything we know a little bit more but then we still we're always not knowing mm -hmm. and, and learning mm -hmm. and if we understand that and don't try to get at the truth or immediate change how will that change the way we act well I think that's huge because I think that most people with the whole climate denier syndrome it, it's that many people just don't have a clue as how science works. So if there's any one little thing that is off, then the whole thing supposedly is, is a conspiracy or wrong or something. And so I think that's not that that's the environmental. That's the humanities there that can help us with that. But I also think it's a, an understanding of scientific epistemology and processes, which I think our country is not so good at. Right. <laughs> Let me also something I think about that. So I agree with you at one level, and I would also say we have no we have no time to solve. So there's a different kind of challenge that we face. And there's other people that are making errors as well. Like the most dangerous person on the planet right now is Elon Musk. Not because of whatever he, Elon Musk. Elon Musk is the most dangerous person. Not because of whatever he did in his marriage and all of that. But because Wait, who, who Elon, is Musk. Elon Musk. Elon Musk. Tesla. 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 Oh, Tesla. yeah. Okay. He's bringing this model to there's a, because there's a because that's a very powerful narrative as well. It's a narrative about the capacities of the technology over and how the limitations that exist at the current moment and the. <coughs> The limit there is not just that it, it kind of won't work like there's all. I can give you a million and one ways why if we all start driving electric cars, well, by we I mean like North Americans, perhaps maybe Europeans, 
because they can't, can't afford it. That's one percent. Um, why it wouldn't solve the problem? But it's it's that I think that there's a desperate desire to address in, environmental um, problems. There's also a desperate desire to absolutely not make any changes to how we are now. Because there's this, there's the, the really powerful social narrative, it seems to me, is that um, is this confirmation that this is the only possible way that humans can live and have ever lived. And um, I have my own things I want to say to the scene, which I might say them both. But one of the absolute holes <coughs> in that narrative, the scene, is that it kind of reconfirms the, the, the entire narrative that it only ever could have been a capitalist. Right. And so this kind of just like, here's how it's unfolded, and this is how it happened, and as a result of that, we somehow then can get us in the idea of history and so on, and all these kinds of things, and just kind of how things happen. Um, which my my student Joe's friend uh, really alerted me to in his own work. But so the, the, these other narratives that one is confronting that make it very difficult for the kind of work of of um, of academics in the arts and humanities to counter. I'm very interested now in figuring how you counter that. Mm -hmm. How you counter that on a very short time scale. And to me, that sounds like um, something that once used to be called political revolution, but on a really, really different axis. So not along ideological axes, but along uh, environmental axes. Um, one that requires uh, something to happen or not. Um, and I'd rather kind of position it that way. And part of the reason for figuring it around energy is that to me, it makes it starkly available. And you, you did a fantastic job responding to us. I've never seen her responded to a PowerPoint. Um, you never like quotes from the talks, quotes. I know. Um, okay. So I think that's, when I'm talking about energy, and I'm talking about fossil fuels, I'm talking about kind of, I guess, fossil fuel being in the world, it's because we have to become some other kind of being in the world without it seeming to be a loss, without it seeming to be something great. Mm -hmm becoming some other excellent, fantastic way of being a society and do it in a really short time frame. So that's, we've not done this, and I'm really curious to see if we can do it. I guess I would still say, I mean, I take your point, but I would still say you have to begin by changing the story. Yep. And I think that's your point. If the story is capitalism is the only way we could have developed and the only thing we can imagine and the only way we can solve, I think you're right, we're not getting there. We have to retell that entire story to imagine a different way, right? And that's, I, so, so I still think it begins with narrative or story or however you want to put it. I, I mean, I don't see how it could be. Dan, Dan wanted to say something. Dan, Dan, Dan Professor. I, I, uh, before Emory, right? Yeah, before he uh, got connected with Priscilla's idea, I was, I was more in, in, uh, in awe of the idea that for some of us, this is very important that we can't just repeat the story of doom. Yeah. Some of us have to appreciate that time proceeds you know, at various paces, but it definitely proceeds slowly. And we're in the trenches. I appreciate your both of you trying to wake us up. But I, I, I really like this idea, and I don't ever hear it. And one of the reasons science is failing is that we never think about how how knowledge accumulates in Donna Bell, which is generation after generation. And the reason I I wanted to have Christina here is that to me she is one of the very few scientists that stay in a place, learn about a place, develop a long-term experiment, and is handing it off to her students. Um, so I would I would I would say I mean I, I like both of your ideas, they're both they're both necessary, but boy, I don't hear Priscilla's counsel. 
Thank you, Priscilla, <laughs> for energizing us both. Oh, uh, okay. I have, I have one last question for um, which is about your um, reference to uh, Bruno Latour and, and his um, his um, comment about how kind of changing narratives have been fueled by by critical theory. How is that? This is in this recent article in the Group Network. Where it's not that they've they've gone ahead and read and seen it. It's that it makes it it provides a certain kind of capacity to underwrite what I'm trying to what the tour is saying is not that climate change deniers have come across the and others and they're like, Well, well, seeing how human beings are as far from it's more that by figuring it back in the space of um, human mm -hmm. capacity, um it means that they don't have to do it. It's like it's it's you you've gone so far afield in yeah. shaping the uh, environment I don't which think was this thing. Uh, even if it were true, I don't, I don't it wasn't like to just have everything out there and actually. So I just I just want to say one thing about about time. So so part part of the is part of this about practice and that I'm really interested in long scale practice. That I have to check. I have to check. So, the um, in Canada, you have quite um, aggressive curbside recycling for houses. So that means um, in Seattle, living now, um, which is at, in Edmonton, part of time, Toronto, part of time, Edmonton, they recycle everything. You have organic recycling, you have whatever. Just put all out of there. And it, it, it isn't just like fiction or recycling. You don't make it to trash. But you can do these mass recycling. So my mother, who's from Hungary, um, do you want to email? She doesn't email? Think about really get what this. Okay, is. I, look at this I try, but she doesn't have the She never get it. Okay. My son doesn't know how not to do it. Yeah. Like he would, he would have to really try hard to like suck it. I just don't. <laughs> and so he just does it. It's like lots of it's. Reasons. How you doing? It's ready to hand. Like, how you doing? You separate stuff out as you do it. And to me, that gives me a lot of sense of capacity for the current state of change that we're seeing. But it has to happen in all kinds of spaces in the same way. And I would say that that comes across from my. I, I would love to talk about the time solution. But that comes across to, to my son not as some impediment, not as some like horrific thing that weighs him down. But it's something free, actually. And so he just does it um, willingly. Not even willing, he just does it. And I think that if we had more of those kinds of systems, produce that from this past. Like when I, when I think about the, I was in Vancouver in the fall, and part of the reason I was there was to look at their um, car sharing programs, because there are so many of them and so extensive. And they have um, they run off phone apps. You don't have to take them to specified sites; just drop them off somewhere in the street once you use them. And it has meant that um, people between this is my sociology or my hat, probably, or my hat. Uh, 18 to 25 year olds, their car owning rate has dropped practically zero. Mm -hmm. So expensive to have insurance.